What's up everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi and I'm a board certified psychiatrist who makes mental health content here on YouTube. If you're new to this community, I would love to make you a member by hitting that subscribe button. It really helps me to know that this information is valuable to you. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for all of the support. It really does mean the world to me. Today's topic is a good one because it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting there as a first year psychiatry resident and I was learning all about antipsychotic medications, or as I like to call them, dopamine blocking medications. And I'm learning about these things and there was one commandment that was always preached to me by every psychopharmacologist that I learned from. And that was that we should never combine two antipsychotic medications. That there's no real value in putting somebody on multiple antipsychotics and it only increases the risk of side effects and other problems. So today what we're going to do is we're going to explore this concept a little more in depth and we're going to see what are some clinical scenarios where one might consider adding a second antipsychotic medication and could it actually be of some value therapeutically for the patient or possibly even as a treatment for side effects themselves. So we're going to talk about all that and more in this video so stay tuned for the next section. So if training programs are preaching the idea of monotherapy when it comes to antipsychotic medications, then how come so many patients are on multiple antipsychotics? And I see this all the time in my clinical practice as an inpatient psychiatrist, that up to 50% of patients who are inpatient will be on more than one antipsychotic. So they'll be receiving what we call antipsychotic polypharmacy. Now the question might become, why is that? If most guidelines discourage the use of multiple antipsychotics, most training programs are teaching residents and other trainees to use a single monotherapy, how come so many people are on these medications? Well, I think in most cases, we're just trying to stabilize patients and get them better. The goal whenever a doctor sees a patient is to help that patient and relieve their suffering. Our primary goal should be to attempt to relieve that person's suffering. Now, when we do this, Sometimes we're going to reach those goals with a single medication. Sometimes we're not going to reach those goals with a single medication. So usually what I see when patients end up on multiple antipsychotics, they have some unique characteristics. Specifically, they tend to have more severe psychotic symptoms. It makes sense, right? Somebody is not stable on a single medication. They have severe symptoms. You want to add another medication. A lot of times these patients are male. They're unemployed. They tend to be younger in age, and those uh, and the other characteristic that's unique to this population is that these are individuals that are often inpatient quite a lot. They're always admitted, and they're usually admitted on involuntary status, and that is some of the characteristics of an individual who might end up on multiple antipsychotic medications. So what do we do when a single medication fails to produce the desired result? Well, there's a difference between rational polypharmacy and irrational polypharmacy, right? There's a ways of going about this that makes sense clinically, and there's ways of going about it that make no sense, which you do see as well. And I see this quite often as working with inpatients and often with people who are having severe psychotic symptoms that are very, very difficult to treat, if not treatment refractory. So we should start this discussion by saying that every patient should be started on a monotherapy. They should be titrated to an effective dose. They should be kept on that medication for six weeks at the effective dose and reevaluate the symptoms, either response or remission at that time. Now, if the person fails that trial for some reason, things don't work out, then obviously switching medications and restarting that time clock is going to be your next approach. So what you're going to do is you're going to start another medication possibly while keeping the other. We do what's called like a cross titration or cross taper. And you may keep the original medication on while slowly bringing that down and then slowly titrating up the new medication at the same time. So you can do this type of titration method if you think it's effective for that individual. And that is usually the ideal way to go about it. You could also consider starting a long acting injectable medication if you think adherence was one of the reasons why the trial failed. Now your clock should start again at that point and you should go through the same process. Titrate to an effective dose. Wait the full six weeks to see the person's whether or not the person has response or remission to that treatment. 
At which point, if the person fails that trial, let's say that things don't work out, then the technical next step is to start clozaril or clozapine, which as I've talked about before, is the most effective of the antipsychotic medications. The issue with this is there's many reasons why clozapine might not be a good option for a patient, one of which is the requirement for weekly blood draws, so you have to get a complete blood cell count every week in order to check for agranulocytosis, which is the most severe but not very common side effect of clozapine. So you have to be careful, you have to do regular monitoring, and if the person has, say, an unstable living situation, may not make it to follow up, then clozapine is not going to be a good option for that person. So assuming this process is followed, what would we do next if the person does not have a clinical response or remission to this treatment? So the first thing you want to consider is receptor binding profiles. So we actually want to look at these medications and determine what receptors are they binding to and how tightly are they binding to the receptors and how long do they stick to those receptors. So what I'm talking about here is that most of your first generation medications such as Haldol are going to bind to those receptors very tightly. So they're going to bind to D2 receptors very tightly and they're going to stay bound to the sites longer. Now, second generation medications like quetiapine, for example, are actually not going to bind very robustly to D2 receptors. They're going to bind to the receptors and quickly dissociate from the receptor, giving what they call an on-off type of effect. Now, tight binding and longer duration, such as that seen in Haldol, is going to lead to more risk for extrapyramidal side effects, EPS, whereas the quick on-off medications such as quetiapine have limited EPS risk. You should also consider other receptors that the medication is binding to, because as we know, these medications bind to more than just D2 receptors. So if you have a medication, for example, that is targeting histamine or muscarinic, cholinergic receptors, then you're going to want to consider those binding profiles as well. It would be best to avoid, for example, combining two medications that have high antihistamine and high anticholinergic activity, or you're going to have a person who is a cognitively impaired, overly sedated, and constipated patient who's going to be very, very unhappy. So paying attention to receptor binding profiles is going to help you make rational decisions if you're going to combine two antipsychotic medications. Let's look at a few scenarios where combining medications makes sense. So let's start with the patient who has acute agitation on say the inpatient unit, which is my specialty. So when I see this, and I see this a lot, um, dealing with psychotic agitation is quite difficult. People are not thinking clearly, right? They have a loss of reality-based thinking, and they can be very angry, upset, frustrated, yelling, screaming, threatening, possibly even causing physical harm to people, right? So if we believe that the agitation is caused by psychosis, so the agitation is being driven by their delusional thinking, for example, then we're going to want to add additional medication in addition to the medication that they're currently on. And this happens a lot. I see this a lot in trainees, right? They'll say like, oh, well, I really think Seroquel or Quetiapine is a good medication for this patient. And the problem is it's usually not that effective. It takes a while to start working and the person remains symptomatic and they might be dangerous as well, like we're talking about here. So the addition of a high potency medication with higher affinity for D2 receptors such as Haldol makes sense, right? Say the person's on quetiapine, I said it has that quick on off like effect. And you're, go and you're going to not have very robust D2 binding. So you might want to go with something that is higher potency. It's going to bind to those D2 receptors a little bit tighter and a little bit longer, which is going to help control the agitation and aggression. And you can kind of slowly titrate that up, starting with lower doses and more frequent administrations, and then going to spread that out and eventually take that medication off once the person has achieved an adequate dose and duration of time on the primary medication, say quetiapine in this case that we're talking about. So this is one place where combining antipsychotic medications will make sense. And you are again looking at the receptor profiles, understanding that quetiapine doesn't have very robust D2 binding and that you're going to get a lot more with the Haldol. So they're going to, these medications are going to complement each other nicely based on the mechanism of action. What about the patient who is refractory to the greatest antipsychotic in the world, 
clozapine. And this does happen sometimes. So even somebody's on clozapine, we think about this as a great medication, the most effective of all the antipsychotics. It has anti-suicidal properties. It's an amazing medication for a lot of patients, but there are some people who it will not work in. So we actually do have a couple of randomized controlled trials here that we can draw on, and there's actually two of them. And both of them looked at low-dose Risperdal. So Risperdal or Risperdone, you can add this in addition to the clozapine. So you would use low-dose Risperdal here. And this is similar to the idea of using Haldol with Cotiapine, right? And listen to me for a second here, you'll understand it. So clozapine has lower D2 receptor blockade, and Risperidone, as we know, has much higher affinity for the D2 receptors and is a strong D2 receptor blocker of, and probably the strongest one of the second generation medications that we're talking about. So again, you're using the complementary binding profiles of these two medications to come up with something that is rational polypharmacy. So there were two placebo controlled trials that support this combination. It might be a good place to start if somebody is treatment refractory to clozapine. Now, before combining medications, I would suggest you get a clozapine level because you can get a plasma level and you can determine whether or not it's therapeutic because some people might be rapid metabolizers, for example, of clozapine. So you would want to know if the person is effectively dosed before you start adding another medication. There's also two recent studies that compared multiple antipsychotic medication combinations and used rehospitalization as their primary outcome and measure of effectiveness. So they looked at whether or not the person who took more than one antipsychotic was rehospitalized after hospitalization. Now, both of these studies actually found a significant reduction in rehospitalization for patients receiving polypharmacy compared to those receiving monotherapy. So it seems like there is some benefit to helping people stay out of the hospital when they're on two antipsychotics versus a single antipsychotic. The best overall outcome was achieved with one specific combination, and that was the combination of clozapine combined with aripiprazole. What about the patient who's on a long-acting injectable who does not achieve remission, but is at the highest dose available for that LAI? Well, this is a common problem in clinical practice, and I'll explain it a little bit more here for you guys. So what I usually see is that the long-acting injectables are limited in terms of the doses that are available. For example, the long-acting injectable formulation of aripiprazole, known as aristata, is limited to a maximum dose of 20 milligrams every four weeks. So we know that the PO or oral form of Abilify can go up to 30 milligrams per day. So we're limited here by the formulation because the maximum dose you could achieve is an equivalent of 20 milligrams per day. So that's a problem. Now one strategy could be to give the injection early. So instead of giving the medication every four weeks, you would consider giving the medication every three weeks, which could theoretically solve your problem. So that's one way to approach it. Another option would be to add another medication with different receptor binding profile, such as clozapine, for example, to the long-acting injectable version of aripiprazole, known as aristata, because this combination, like we said in the previous section, was shown to improve rehospitalization rates significantly for patients on multiple medications. So that might be an option. You could also simply supplement with more or additional oral medication, so you could add another 10 milligrams per day PO, but again, that kind of limits the usefulness of a long-acting injectable, which is the benefit is the person does not have to take a pill every day, they just have the medication available for 30 days in the long-acting injectable form. So how about for treatment of insomnia? So insomnia can be a problem in a lot of psychiatric disorders. Honestly, I always say one of the big things we do as psychiatrists is get people to sleep. So let's say, for example, somebody is on the medication paliperidone, which is known to be a less sedating medication, doesn't really cause as much tiredness, etc. And what we could do in that case is look at low-dose quetiapine. So once you've had maximum D2 receptor blockade, for example, with the paliperidone or risperdal, say, then it doesn't really make sense to add another medication that has really strong D2 blockade. You'd want to go with something that's going to have more antihistamine effects, such as quetiapine, at its lower doses. So you could start 25 to 50 milligrams at bedtime, and this would be a reasonable way to use polypharmacy again. So here's another example of a way we could combine medications 
based on the receptor binding profiles that would help us potentially clinically. Now, the medication should be used on an as-needed basis only, meaning it's PRN. It should not be used every day if it's not needed. And obviously, you should try to remove the medication once the person's insomnia has resolved and symptoms are better controlled. You can also consider a sleep study if the individual has potentially sleep apnea, for example. You could also consider other medications such as short-term orexin antagonist therapy, which is a medication that's more of a new mechanism of action, but seems to be very effective. You could also try things like melatonin or sedating antidepressants if appropriate. It may be surprising to you to think that we might use a second antipsychotic medication to treat a side effect of the primary medication. So let's say that somebody is very, very stable on a medication, say Risperdal, for example, and they're doing quite well on it, but you come to discover that they have an elevated prolactin level, which is a scary thing to have and not necessarily something that you're going to want. It can be troublesome for the patient, it can be troublesome for you as the clinician or prescriber, so you have to be careful to work with this and to potentially treat it. Now you might want to consider the addition of a low dose of aripiprazole, because aripiprazole has been proven in clinical trials to reduce prolactin levels, so it actually can be used to decrease prolactin levels. Another possibility is using aripiprazole to reduce the metabolic burden, of medications such as clozapine or orlanzapine. So there is some evidence to support the use of aripiprazole in those cases. This data is much more limited than its effects on prolactin. So I would say I usually use it if I have an issue with prolactin that I'm trying to address, but you could also potentially use it to offset some of the metabolic side effects of the heavier hitting or more metabolically uh, compromising medications such as orlanzapine or clozapine. Final situation might be the most common one that we see clinically, and that is in the process of switching a medication, a person achieves remission suddenly. So what happens in this common clinical scenario is the person is not responding appropriately or as well as you would like to a medication. You decide that you're going to start another medication at a low dose, while slowly taking the old medication off. So you're slowly tapering the old medication off while titrating the new medication. This is the so-called cross titration that I've been talking about in this video. But what happens? What happens in this case is you reach kind of a sweet spot during this process. So before you taper off the old medication, before you completely titrate the new medication, the person is suddenly better. Now what do you do? Because you're in the middle of this process, and you're not and you're, you don't want to mess it up right the person's doing well you want to just you want to just stay in that sweet spot so this happens a lot and people stay in that sweet spot but ultimately people end up usually having symptoms or problems they might end up hospitalized for example and um, there's a number of reasons why i don't want to get into all of them here why somebody might stop at that at that point but really what you should do is you should finish the the, the cross taper you should titrate the, medic the new medication all the way up to an effective dose, and you should taper the old medication completely off. That's what should be done in these cases. So in order to avoid polypharmacy in that case, it's very simple. You're just going to finish the titration and the taper. Just do it properly, get it done, and then evaluate whether or not the person has been successful and reaches remission with the new medication choice, because they very well might. Even though they kind of hit that sweet spot in the middle, they may still achieve remission with the new medication. So what we see here in this video, and the whole point of it is that there really is limited data to support the use of multiple antipsychotic medications. However, it's done clinically all the time, and you're going to see this if you're, a, again, a psychiatrist or a prescriber of any type. Now, there are a few places where the addition of a second medication, a second antipsychotic medication, makes sense. And we can do much better clinically and help our patients much better if we pay attention to things like the receptor profiles that I described earlier and trying to see the difference between making rational polypharmacy decisions and irrational polypharmacy decisions. We want to make the rational ones and we want to avoid the excess risk of side effect burden and other complications of using multiple medications. So they can be used, you can use multiple antipsychotics, but you have to be careful which ones you combine and you should have a rationale for why you're doing it.
So I'm going to hold the video there, guys. I would love to see your comments and questions below. Please drop them there. I will try to get to them as soon as I can. Thanks again for watching, and if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so now.